In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Not long ago, uh, just last month, in the blessed month of Kiak, the Church was dedicating the entire month to blessing and to praising the Mother of God, the Holy Virgin, St. Mary. Uh, it began with Archangel Gabriel himself announcing to her the good news and praising her, calling her, Hail to you, O full of grace, the Lord is with you. Full of grace. And the Church dedicates that entire month for that purpose as well. And today, on the second Sunday of the following month of Tuba, the Gospel begins referring to a woman that raised her voice in the middle of the crowd and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. And so the Church and God's children continue to praise the Holy Virgin Mary just like the Holy Virgin Mary herself, when she met with Elizabeth, her cousin, said, Behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. And this was not something that she claimed for herself, but it was just an acknowledgement and being aware with the eyes of prophecy that God has granted her this, that she be praised by all generations. And so indeed, we see the fulfillment of this here, you know, almost 30 years later, when the Lord Christ grew and he was performing his, his healing ministry in the earth, and, said, and the, this woman saw him and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. That is the Holy Virgin, St. Mary. And this happened, in the beginning of this passage, it says, And it happened as he spoke these things. He had just finished healing uh, a person who was demon-possessed. And so it caused a division. Some, like this woman, saw in this a sign that this is the Lord, the Messiah. And she could say nothing else but to break out in praise, praising his mother and praising him. But others, as we see later on in the Gospel passage, others like the Pharisees doubted this and said, you know, he's doing this by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And they were still requesting for a sign. And this is kind of the, the motive behind the Lord's discourse in the remaining of this passage. But the Lord takes the opportunity that this woman praised him and his mother and extends this blessing to all the rest of us. And he says more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So the Lord always takes this opportunity to remind us that what made the Holy Virgin Mary great is hearing the Word of God and doing it. Hearing the Word of God and doing it. And just like the Virgin Mary carried the Word of God in her womb, just like she nourished Him and nurtured Him for nine months, watching over this mystery of the Incarnation inside of her, we also, when we hear the Word of God, keep it in ourselves and nourish it, help it to grow, cultivate it. We too are worthy of similar blessings. Blessed are those who hear the Word of God. And this is a play on words, right? Because the Word of God is both the Word that you hear about God, God's commandments and laws, God's life, and also it is the Word, with a big W, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. So the analogy here is that the Holy Virgin Mary was worthy of such blessings because she carried the Word of God in her womb, literally, physically, as well as spiritually. But we too carry Him inside of us when we nourish Him, when we cause the Word of God to grow in us and not suffocate it. And therefore we are also worthy of similar blessings. But then he turns his attention to the Pharisees and Jews, the ones that doubted his ability to cast out demons, and says, this is an evil generation. You see, these blessings that the Lord speaks of, of hearing his word and being worthy of such blessings, they're not a divine right. And it's not simply by virtue of being a Christian it's not simply by virtue of being baptized and a member of the church. 
that you become worthy of such blessings. It's not the same simply to physically hear the word of God and to keep it in the way that the Lord intends here. And so he turns his attention to the Jews and says, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign and no sign will be given to it. And he mentions two examples of people that were actually physically far from the Lord. The people of Nineveh, both geographically far from the land of Israel and also far from the Lord in their lives of sin. And fairly soon in the next month or so, we will have the fast of Jonah in which we meditate upon, the, upon this story of repentance. So the Lord reminds us that it is not those necessarily that are physically in the church that are actually children of God. But it can be people that you don't expect, like the people of Nineveh, or like the Queen of the South, as he says. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of his generation and condemn them. Why? Because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon's. She came all the way from the ends of the earth, very far away country. So the Lord is reminding the Jews of his time that yes, anyone who hears the word of God and keeps it is worthy of such blessings. But it's not just hearing it physically, it's not just being part of an, a specific group, the people of Israel or fill in the Orthodox Church, if you will. It is those who hear it and do it. And the people of Nineveh heard and repented. It was an action followed, following their hearing of the word of God. The Queen of the South came all the way and heard the wisdom of Solomon. And of course, we know that in Scripture, we never, we, whenever we hear of the word wisdom, we understand by it the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God and the word of God. And so these two examples point for us this direction that simply hearing the word of God, simply being members of the church, simply coming to church and participating in the mysteries is not sufficient in itself. It has to reflect in our lives. It has to reflect in a life of repentance. And then we, are, we can truly say, as the Lord said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Not just hear it, but keep it, protect it as something that is extremely precious and very life-giving for our own lives. So oftentimes we also look for signs. This is an evil and adulterous generation. It seeks for a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. We also sometimes make our relationship with God contingent upon signs in our own lives. Whether it is a sign of material wealth, whether it is success, education, whether it is prosperity for us and our family, or even if it is physical health. See, if God protects me, if God takes care of me, and not, not allow me to catch COVID or get into any other health problems, then God is truly with me. But when something bad happens, we wonder, where is God in our lives? These are asking for signs. And the Lord comes and says, it's not about the signs. Don't make your, your relationship with Christ contingent upon prosperity. Contingent upon you uh, acquiring things or living a prosperous, peaceful, what you consider to be a happy life. Sometimes these temptations are themselves there to bring you into the right track. Sometimes such tribulations, whether it is health issues, whether it is any other misfortune, is there to strengthen you and give you a chance to be that much more uh, uh, steadfast in your relationship with the Lord. And oftentimes we think that things go from good to bad and not back again. But history always tells us that the Lord gives us these temptations only then to bring us back out onto refreshment, as it says in the book of Psalms. We just read this morning about the, the story in the Synexar about the consecration of the church of St. Macarius, the altar of St. Macarius in his uh, uh, monastery. And as with any other kind of work of hagiography, lives of saints, it, it gives you an, an account and it doesn't quite capture for you the, the, the intensity of the story. Pope Benjamin, the one that was the protagonist of this story, he was living away from his patriarchate for years. 
under Persian occupation and Byzantine occupation. Imagine, imagine with me today if, if Pope Teodros himself was no longer in Cairo, in the cathedral. No one knows where he is. He's hiding somewhere. It says that Pope Benjamin went to the monastery of St. Macarius and then went to Upper Egypt. Upper Egypt in, in church history is the place you go to where no one can find you. That is known. So imagine with me the state of the church during that period in the early 7th century where the Pope himself and all the bishops, as it says in his life, left and what they considered to be under divine inspiration, left and went into hiding. The church is without a shepherd. And the monasteries themselves were in great division. Some of the monasteries in Wadi Natrun at the time were taken over by the Byzantine Empire and were given over to those who accepted the Council of Chalcedon. And there was great division in the monasteries. These uh, uh, steadfast fortresses, as we think of them today, of Coptic Christianity, were divided. And eventually, after all of this went away, and Arab occupation came, and they favored the Copts at the time, Pope Benjamin then was able to do what we read about today in the Synexar, travel to the wilderness at the invitation of the monks, and consecrate the altar. And it is known in history as kind of a new beginning, a new bright beginning in the history of our church, where monasticism was once again firmly established, reorganized, and there was a new era, a renaissance, if you will, of Coptic Orthodoxy. So the Lord gives temptation, and that is the lesson that we take. Not prosperity, not a sign, as the Pharisees were asking, but a lesson to bring us back. And finally, the Lord says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. That is a foreshadowing and a reminder for us for the upcoming feast on Tuesday of the Holy Theophany, what is sometimes called the Feast of Lights. Baptism itself in the early church was often referred to as enlightenment. Because when we are baptized, we become children of the light. As we pray every night, arise, O children of the light, let us praise the Lord of hosts. The children of the light are we, because we have received baptism in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ himself who came and said he came, uh, he is the light of, who, who, who enlightens every man that comes into the world. He is the light, and we receive light from him. So that is what we celebrate this coming Tuesday if you join us in the prayers for the Holy Theophany. And the Lord here is giving us just one small meditation in that direction, that direction of light. That if we keep our eyes pure, if we strive with all of our strength to return to this baptismal purity that we had as little pure infants baptized into the church, then we receive the same light that shines upon us in the Holy Feast of the Theophany. When we strive in this sense, when we return as much as we can to this purity of our eyes, the purity of our souls, once the eye is pure, the whole body is pure. How beautiful it is to think that one can live so purely, where you only gaze upon things that are of God, and you don't have eyes for anything else in the world. This life of that ultimate and pure and complete dedication to maintaining yourself as a pure offering for the Lord by maintaining your eyes pure. And the eyes are, are just, you can extend that to any of your other senses. It's not just about vision. It's not physical eyes that I'm talking about. It is the eyes of your mind and heart. What is it that you desire the most? What is it that you have longing eyes, we say metaphorically, for? And so once we preserve this purity, then we can enter into the waters of the Jordan with the Lord Jesus Christ, and like he did, trample upon the powers of evil, the powers of darkness and destruction that are in our lives and in the world at large, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then also we can soar in the heights as the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. We can soar with the Lord. And then also finally, we become worthy to hear the voice of the Father saying, this you and you and you, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. To Him be the glory now and forever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.